Hello and welcome to Explore Bio. Today you will learn about Western blotting which is one of the most widely used techniques in molecular biology. In this video I will first mention why do we use Western blotting that is its application part. Next we will see what Western blotting is, what is its principle and how it works. I will try to explain each of these steps involved in Western blotting in a visual or animated manner. And at last some of the important things that needs to be considered if you are planning to use western blotting technique for your experiments. So watch the video till the end. Before coming on to what western blotting is and how it works it is important to know why this technique is used. If you are interested in identification of a specific protein in a sample or identification of a disease causing agent by targeting its receptor protein or if you want to see the relative expression of protein in different samples or under different treatment conditions one of the most useful techniques is western blotting. It is used both for research as well as disease diagnosis purpose. Western blotting is a method to detect a specific protein or antigen using antibodies. Western blotting utilizes a set of specific primary antibody and reporter labeled secondary antibody to detect a protein or antigen of interest. Blotting is a process in which you transfer the proteins separated on gel to a more durable membrane for detection using labeled antibodies. Therefore, it is also termed as protein immunoblotting. If you want to learn more about antibodies, monoclonal antibodies, ELISA, you can check out these videos. Now let's see step by step procedure for western blotting. You first need to have high quality proteins from the sample of interest. It may be a blood sample, plant tissue or any other. You precisely quantify the proteins before proceeding further. The proteins are then loaded and separated using SDS switch or SDS polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis providing a high voltage. The SDS switch is made in two layers. The upper smaller gel is called as stacking gel which has larger pore size and lower gel is bigger which is resolving gel as shown here. SDS in the gel binds and imparts overall negative charge to the proteins. Thus all the proteins are separated based on the size of proteins only. Next, the separated proteins on the gel are transferred to a more durable nitrocellulose or PVDF membrane electrophoretically while keeping in ice for about 1 to 2 hours. In this picture you can see how the membrane and the gel are arranged along with the filter papers and how the protein bands are getting transferred. Just for understanding I am showing the bands here but they do not become visible until the last step. You can only see the pre stand protein ladder. The membrane is then treated with blocking agents like BSA or casein to minimize the chances of non-specific antibody binding to the membrane. The proteins bound to the membrane are suspended in a solution of primary antibodies overnight with constant shaking so that antibodies bind to the targeted protein of interest. The unbound antibodies are washed off using buffers like TBST. And next it is transferred to a solution of secondary antibodies that are labeled with a reporter dye or enzyme for around 1 hour. The membrane is again washed with TBST buffer for a few minutes. Till now the bands are not visible with naked eyes. Depending upon the reporter dye attached to the secondary antibodies, the bands of the specific proteins are detected using chemiluminescence, chemifluorescence, fluorescence, chromogenic or radioisotopic detection system. For example, if the secondary antibody is labeled with enzyme HRP or horseradish peroxidase, the labeled antibody can be visualized when exposed to its chromogenic substrate to produce a colored product. Now you can see the protein bands. Based on the expected and observed size and intensity of the band, presence of a specific protein and its approximate relative quantity can be determined. To understand better, suppose in a certain experiment you are cloning and expressing a specific protein from plant in a different system such as yeast and is tagged with hexahistidine or GFP and you want to confirm if the protein is actually expressed in that organism or not. Then you can use either target protein specific primary antibodies or you may use antihistidine or anti-GFP primary antibodies. Next, use the reporter tagged secondary antibodies to detect the primary antibodies as I described before. Primary antihistidine and anti-GFP antibodies and reporter labeled secondary antibodies are easily available from companies. 
but if you want to be highly specific and sure about your target protein, you need to get primary antibodies specific for the protein of interest synthesized from a company. But this can cost you more. The company will produce primary antibodies specific for your protein of interest in an organism such as mouse, rat, goat or rabbit. Suppose you choose to get primary antibodies from rat. Then you have to use anti-rat secondary antibodies for proper binding else you may not get the band. Therefore, it is important to know the origin of primary antibodies. This picture shows the actual steps involved in western blotting. Right from the separation of proteins on the gel followed by transfer to the membrane followed by blocking, incubation with primary and secondary antibodies and elimination. You can see that the proteins can be detected only after secondary antibody binding and chemiluminescence in our case. Now some important things you should consider while performing western blotting experiments. While comparing relative expression of proteins in multiple samples or treatments, it is important to make precise quantification of proteins and load equal quantity of total protein in each well. But still, western blotting will not give you precise estimation of relative expression. The size of desired protein on gel or membrane may vary slightly due to post-translational modifications. Also, if your protein is GFP tagged, the size of band will be sum of the target protein and GFP. To learn more about green fluorescent protein or GF, do watch my video on it. It is always recommended to run positive and negative controls. The positive control will be your targeted purified protein and negative control will be a protein which lacks your target protein along with the samples to check if the western blotting is done correctly or not. If polyclonal antibodies are used, you may get few non-specific bindings. But based on the size of protein, you can determine your protein of interest. Care needs to be taken that transfer membrane is not handled by bare hands, rather use tweezers to hold from the corners. For efficient transfer of proteins to the membrane, proper contact between gel and membrane should be carefully made. Duration of the antibody exposure and washing can be increased or decreased to reduce non-specific binding and getting clearer bands. If you find the information useful, do check out my playlist on techniques, genomics, markers, plant tissue culture, vaccines and others. If you are interested in research and publishing, you can check out my series of helpful videos covering almost everything you need to know about it. In case of suggestions or requests, do comment or email me at explorebio at yahoo.com. Thanks and see you in my next video.